So hello again, uh, as you can see I'm sat in front of my board and the board is empty. It's 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. This in my hand, it looks like wine but it's not wine. And there was a time, years ago now, where 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning a glass of wine in my hand would have been perfectly normal. And in this video I'm going to explain to you why it no longer is. Over the last few weeks, um, since about no October last year, I've been co-writing a book with another domestic violence survivor about our escape from domestic violence and abusive relationships. And of course, it's, it's made me think back to those days. And for 45 years of my life, I was addicted to alcohol. Um, even at the time, I, I was quite happy to admit it, uh, and I'm going to explain to you why. It seemed a perfectly normal way of life at the time, um, and I'm going to sort of take you through uh, what led up to me falling in and out of abusive relationships what it was that made me finally decide and make the effort to break the cycle of alcoholism and what I've been doing since then, how, how it's affected me. And because I'm an artist, it definitely came out in my art. I mean, being constantly drunk, um, having, having all the depression, the paranoia, and the anger that goes along with being an alcoholic obviously came out in the artwork. And I've looked through my back catalogue, I've uh, found a few illustrations that I think will illustrate some of my, my journey to becoming alcohol free, which I hope you're going to find interesting. I've watched quite a lot of YouTubers talking about this now, and they all seem to be young, fit, healthy, running through the woods, going to the gym, and it's all their, their journey and that's brilliant. But I, I've always asked myself, where are the older people? Where are the disabled people? Where are the people who were hooked on it for decades? We're a very microscopic presence on YouTube, aren't we? So yeah, I hope I've got some things from my own journey that will help other people. Maybe some tips that will be useful. And as usual, the disclaimer, this is just my own experience. So let's go and uh, let's raise a glass to being alcohol free. Uh, so this very first picture uh, is called Teenage Depression. Um, I was introduced to alcohol at a very young age and I do mean very young. My mother made homemade wine and beer at home, presumably for reasons, financial reasons, uh, from fruit and plants and flowers she grew herself um, at their allotment and in their garden. And she used me as a taster for her wine from at least age six. Um, there is a logic to this. T children have a very, obviously a very clean and innocent palate. And uh, I used to taste her wine that she was taking round to the wine circle and I could always predict if she was going to win the uh, sort of competition with her wine. So got a taste for it at a very young age. By the time I was going through my very troubled teenage years, which I've talked about on other podcasts, uh, including gender dysphoria, including suicidal ideation, um, I was already by that time spending my school dinner money on alcohol and absconding from school, what we used to call skiving from school and drinking cans of beer out in the countryside. Yeah, that was normal for me. So this picture is from the days before the internet when we listened to pirate radio stations. And you might remember a song, a Tom Robinson song, which has the words in it, a thousand miles on either side, stations fading into the unknown. And that was very evocative, that song it reminded me of my miserable teenage years. 
this picture it's a science fiction picture actually done back in you know the the 80s for somebody's uh, uh, stories uh, illustrate somebody's stories i can't remember what it was uh, but i'm using it to illustrate the um the secretive nature of drinking when you're holding down a job mixing with people so after dropping out of school and at the age of 16 i didn't go on to higher education i went to what we call the school of hard knocks and uh, in, by the time I was in my 20s, I was a very heavy drinker. I was in the construction industry. In fact, I worked for the most corrupt council in, in England at that time, Lambeth in London. And what we used to do was pretend to do a bit of work in the mornings. All pan in the pub at midday when it opened. Come out of the pub at 3 p.m., go back, clear up the site and then everybody back in the pub again about 5 p.m. Um, so <laughs> that's what my life was like. That was pretty much every day. Um, and there was a big drinking culture, of course. And in those days, what that meant was that you were supposed to match your drinking companions drink for drink, which is a pretty stupid thing to do when you're in a male only industry or male dominated industry and uh, you're a five foot nothing woman. Uh, quite clearly, you're not going to be able to keep up with them and you're going to get drunk very, very quickly. So this um, picture makes me think of the kind of hiding, trying to hide my drinking from normal people, pretending that, you know, it wasn't as bad as it really was. Ducking and diving, I suppose. Uh, this picture is about the, the feelings you, you have when you're a heavy drinker. Alcohol itself affects your brain. It makes you angry. It makes you depressed. It makes you paranoid. And because you don't realise you're hooked on it, you think those are your normal feelings and you're using the alcohol to alleviate them. And what you don't realise is that those first few minutes when you have those first couple of drinks and you feel great and you're enjoying everybody's company, that is when you're kind of, um, that's when you're coming back from, from the addiction and you don't realise that all that is is just that very first few minutes of alleviating it uh, and it will soon be back. <laughs> and uh, obviously the sickness, the headaches and the hangovers uh, come afterwards. Um, by the time I was in my 30s, I was taking a bottle of whiskey to work with me in my pocket. And by the time lunchtime came round every day, I would already be planning how much booze I was going to buy on the way home, what I was going to buy on the way home. And I didn't have much of a social life at all. I, I just was just work, go home, drink, go to sleep, get up, work again. Um, this situation wasn't helped by... The, the fact that I, I did a lot of night work so didn't socialize much with normal people anyway and uh, I would just be sat at home drinking in the evenings but if uh, people did offer me company and I was invited to things it always involved booze I mean obviously I surrounded myself with people who were the same who, who wanted to be in pubs all the time and I would never say no if people offered me a drink or offered to buy me an extra drink. I thought the circle of people I was in liked me for myself, but of course they were only ever drinking buddies and I couldn't see that. I called this picture NY, which is worse than boredom. Uh, people do drink when they're bored, but I drank because I had no better purpose in life. Than, than just to work like a dog to keep a roof over my head. I was an artist as well, and I, I was involved with the science fiction illustration, which I've talked about in other videos. But that was uh, like um, my fancy life. Um, it was the only thing that took me away from uh, the misery of my real life, if you like. 
so I, I could not escape the drinking culture I'd surrounded myself with. I had it during the day in my workplaces and I had it at, in the evening because of the social pe people in my social life. And many years later, when I'd escaped from all this, a much older, wiser friend said to me, if you only ever meet people in pubs, you will only meet losers. And that sounds horrible when you you think, oh, well, no, wait, a minute, my friends aren't losers. What does that mean? But how right he, how right he was, and, and I wish somebody had said that to me when I was in my 20s and 30s. But, you know, by then it was already too late and I, I couldn't really have changed the trajectory my life was on if I'd tried. This is uh, definitely the most sinister of these drawings. Uh, again, I think it was illustrating somebody's story. I drove for my work, obviously. I drove a van with all my tools on it, a ladder on top. And I was drink driving regularly. Pretty much every day, probably. Lucky I was never pulled over for it. Uh, in my early 40s, I was still working in the building trade just about I I had then I had fallen into a domestic violence relationship which took another four years for me to escape from with the help of the police and I did actually get my abuser convicted in fact I'm co-writing a book about escaping from domestic violence at the moment as I said at the beginning of this video which is making me think back to these days driving was a big part of the danger I was in 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 an abusive relationship because he was a psychopath who didn't care about attacking me in the car when we were on the motorway it was an absolute miracle we were not killed in the car he also encouraged me to drink because having me drunk was a way of being under his control and even when i was in the process of trying to escape from him i would still go out into the countryside sit in the car and drink so this very much sums up what I was like regarding drink driving. <laughs> the car was a kind of sanctuary, <laughs> if you like, where I'd sit and listen to music and, and drink. Uh, well, there are going to be people listening to this who may have done the same thing. And I'm sure you can understand what I mean. So it wasn't until I was 50, um, I actually got married when I was 50 for the first ever time, which proves, if it proves nothing else, that there's somebody out there for everybody. And uh, obviously that made me start thinking seriously about giving up drinking. Uh, unfortunately, my husband was also a heavy drinker. Um, so that's not easy. And we did sort of make efforts like not having booze in the house and things like that. So I started making efforts to stop drinking. I went to my GP. I had so many health reasons to stop. I had so many social reasons to stop. There wasn't a single reason to carry on drinking. I didn't even enjoy going to pubs. You know, I didn't even enjoy the kind of people we met in pubs. Um, so first of all, my GP recommended going to AA. And, you know, I tried it. I really tried it. I went to, I, I, I knew I didn't like AA because of the religious aspect of it. And the very first and only group I went to, it was actually in a church. Uh, with all the, the big book, which is just like the Bible and the rules on the wall, which is just like the Ten Commandments no, and the prayers. And nobody can say it's not an alternative religion because it is. Now, this obviously appeals to a lot of people i'm not knocking it it's the most success one of the most successful methods of stopping drinking uh so I, you know I, I i i tried it and the people at this particular meeting basically looked me up and down and asked me when the last time i'd had a drink was and i said oh, previous evening i will never forget the look on their faces it was as if I just, I was a complete fake, you know, that I shouldn't even have been there. 
and I presumed that you had to crawl off the street in rags uh, to be their, their version of whatever an alcoholic was. So that's what this picture is actually and I did this picture quite recently um, to illustrate some stories for somebody. So by the time I'd gone to that AA meeting I had been an addict since the age of six. We are talking 40 or 35 years. So I only went that one time, as you can imagine. The other place the GP directed me to was an addiction clinic, uh, which was in a back street in the middle of town, right behind a street which had the most pubs on it <laughs> of any street in town, a very popular street leading down to the docks. <laughs> so even just going to this street was quite a challenge not to go into any other pubs uh, before I went to the clinic which is an odd place to put an addiction clinic when you think about it. So the people who ran this clinic, I'm not saying anything against them. They definitely meant well and they, but they were only a nine to five operation. They were only, they were set up for people who were not working for people who were on benefits or were so uh, ill with their alcoholism that they couldn't hold down a job, that kind of thing. Um, and so it was difficult for me to keep in touch with them. I think the most they managed to do for me was, was have a once a week check up phone call. So I didn't actually feel that it worked very well, although I did try with it. So as you can see, I was making efforts to give up the booze, not having it in the house, trying to limit myself to one or two drinks when we did go to a pub. And it wasn't until 2018 that I finally was able to kick it. And this next picture I'm showing you is an advert for one of my art shows. And I'm going to tell you next how I, how I managed to give it up and, and maybe some tips that will help other people. So here I am sat at my board again. Um, on the board I've just put up some flyers that I used to have for my one woman shows which were of course held in pubs <laughs> and the main, there, was, there was reasons for that. Um, other venues were expensive, Pet pubs are usually free for artists because they think you're going to encourage your mates to come in and all buy a drink so um, you know pubs are good venues for artists. But also, of course, you know, because I was drinking. So, uh, so as I've said, it wasn't until 2018 that I held this show here. Um, and I'd been calling my show The Corridor of Power for a, a couple of years while I was at the Morning Star uh, because it was an annual review of my political cartoons. Um, this one was held in a pub called the Colston Arms. By the time you see this video, it might have changed its name, Colston again. And uh, I remember I'd gone up to sit to my show after work with a mate who wanted to come and see it. And we were sat in the pub with halves of cider, because I was always a rough cider drinker, having a laugh, having a look at my show, and I remember thinking it was literally like a light bulb going off over my head. I remember thinking, I'm having such a good time laughing and joking with my mate here. I could be doing this just the same without the cider, without the alcohol. It really was. And I'd been leading up to that point, trying to give up in various ways, hadn't succeeded. I had managed to pick up the Alan Carr book and this is the Alan Carr book. Here we are, show it to you. Hope you can see it. The easy way to give up drinking. Um, it, it's been published under various titles. The one I picked up was the audio book with a CD. And I got it for practically nothing from a charity shop. You don't need to pay a load of money to do these things. I think now you can download it from their site. You can pay a lot more money if you want to. You can go along to seminars and all this sort of stuff. 
I found I didn't need to do that. So I finished talking to my mate in the pub, went home, told nobody I was doing it. By the end of that week, I had read through the book, listened to the, the tape a, a few times. So this is a combination of um, cognitive behaviour therapy and hypnosis. If you don't like hypnosis, then this isn't going to be for you. Uh, I want to repeat what I said at the beginning. These type of videos can only ever be one person's experience. Uh, so, that's what I did. And then I went into work the following week and told my colleagues that I, you know, I was giving up drinking. And uh, the, only, the only thing in this book that didn't apply to me was that he says it should be easy for you to remember back to the days before you ever had your first drink. I couldn't do that because the days before I had my first drink was before the age of six. <laughs> so I didn't have those memories. Uh, but other people will have those memories. That, that bit just didn't apply to me. Um, so I'm going to now hopefully run through some things I found out through, through how I gave up and how I had to how I had to talk to people afterwards about it and one or two tips that might help other people out. So I've got four things <clears throat> that people don't tend to tell you about becoming sober and four things that might be tips. So here's the first thing uh, that people don't tell you. Very few people will openly support you. This is a real surprise. Now, if you're really lucky, you might have family and friends who are all completely gung-ho and cheering you on your way and joining in with it themselves. And that's absolutely that. You aren't you lucky is what I would say. Because typical comments when I told friends and colleagues that I'd given up drinking were things like three weeks, tell me again after three months. Uh, you never drank heavily. I only ever saw you with a half. Surely one won't hurt and all that sort of thing. Um, in fact, as soon as you even mention it, the vast majority of people go immediately straight onto the defensive. Because alcohol is the drug of choice in the UK, and it's, so they never sort of, it's never, they never answer it with um, saying, oh, oh, aren't you great, well done, oh, I wish I could do it, or anything like that. It's always a defensive, oh, well, of course, I only ever drink on special occasions, or I only ever drink on the weekends, I only ever drink once a week, I hardly drink at all, as if you were interrogating them. And that is because it's so much part of the British culture. The second thing you only find out when you do this is how, <clears throat> how all pervasive alcohol is, how it's everywhere and everybody around you seems to be dependent on it in one way or another. And not just socially, uh, in work as well. Uh, so I remember the first Christmas I became sober, Christmas 2018, went back into work after the new year. And I remember hearing a guy telling his colleagues about how he couldn't remember anything about Boxing Day because he'd spent it all, blotto, on his mum's settee, completely out of it. And this was a funny story. And that was a real eye-opener to me because I thought a few months before, not only would I have been laughing with them about that, but I would have been the one coming in saying that I'd spent Boxing Day lying on a settee comatose because of booze. So yeah, it, it is a shock and it's a shock to, to remember how, how many times during an ordinary day you, you, you thought about it and how so much of your life was spent planning around it, where you could go for your next drink, if you were going on holiday, what pubs were nearby, everything. It is all pervasive. The third thing is how difficult it is to explain to people why you've given up, how, how, how badly you were in the grip of alcohol, the terrible situations it led you into, maybe being ruined financially, being in physical danger, in my case, domestic violence, 
almost being killed in the car numerous times because of drink driving. All those things happened to me. And it to people who those things have never happened, they, they really find that impossible to understand. But on top of all that, how bad your decision making was when you were drinking. You, you mind all you're thinking about all day long is the next drink. Yeah, it's almost impossible. I would advise not getting into big, long conversations about it, actually. Um, uh, and there's something about that in my tips. So the final thing I'm going to mention that people don't tell you is that giving up booze is not a panacea for everything else. It's not a miracle cure for all your other problems. I, I've always had to be very careful of my health with the diabetes. I, I was always overweight and you don't miraculously suddenly cure those things just from giving up the booze. Uh, when I gave up drinking I dropped 3,000 calories a week, didn't lose an ounce on the scales uh, because many people including myself when you come off alcohol you, you, you go on to a sugar binge uh, to kind of replace it, to replace the energy that your body thinks I suppose that alcohol was giving you. Uh, and that sugar addiction can also take you months to shake off. And that's another huge struggle for most people. So again, there's some very simple tips about that. So here's some tips that I, things that I used in the first few months of sobriety, and I still do use them, which I hope you'll find useful. So the first one is don't drop all your friends who drink. Uh, it would be a shame if you've built friendships up over years just because somebody likes to drink and you don't want to hang out with them anymore. Um, obviously, the thing to do is just politely let them know you're off it. Uh, you can. There are plenty of non-alcohol beers and ciders and lagers on the market now. Uh, most pubs serve them. Uh, you, you can still go out to pubs with people. Oh, obviously, don't let... Don't let people bully you into being the driver just because they know you're not drinking. Uh, I mean, you don't want to be you don't want to be lumbered with that. But you will probably find that you you gradually start going to new places anyway, where, where not everybody is drinking. Uh, more coffee shops, perhaps, than going to pubs all the time. And you will gradually make new friends. Uh, I, I wouldn't drop everybody all at once. It would be a very weird thing to do and just put you under more stress. So leading on from the previous tip, uh, my, my next tip is have, have high class soft drinks. Um, so if you're in a pub or a restaurant and you order a soft drink, make sure they serve it to you in a proper wine glass. Don't make anybody drink you out of a kiddies glass with a straw. You are an adult who has given up boozing. You're not a child. Um, there, are, there are some very good soft drinks on the market. Uh, there's a make called Crawford's Press that do a very nice range of fruit juices. And most brewers are now catering for non-drinkers. So you should be able to order them and you, you shouldn't need to feel out of place when you're out in a group of people. Uh, in, a, in a fairly good class restaurant, you could probably ask for a mocktail and you can, of course, mix your own at home. And personally, I think things like Bloody Marys and margaritas taste just as good without the alcohol. Uh, in fact, they actually taste better because now you're drinking for the taste and you're not drinking just because you want to get blotto. So definitely holding a wine glass in your hand. I found that a very comforting thing to do in a few months after giving up because it was part of my kind of life and uh, there's nothing wrong with that. So definitely drink your nice fruit juices out of a wine glass. It, you'd be surprised, it makes all the difference and it helps you fit in with people. And tip three is um, don't argue with people. Try and stay friends. This leads on from the thing that they don't tell you, which is that people do uh, get very riled up sometimes. They, they feel that you're having a go at them. So you need to counter the opposition or mockery you might get from people who you thought were your friends. I would say continue to believe the best about them because it probably really is just ignorance. Um, so what I've always said to people, 
to somebody who can't really understand it i i say what i felt when i first thought of giving it up when i was sitting with my mate in the pub and really enjoying being there chatting to him so i say i'm here for your company you've invited me i'm here and i enjoy being here with you so much better nowadays and i'm not going to get lotto and be an embarrassment to you <laughs> or be sick in the gutter or have to have to leave have to leave the place in disgrace so isn't that a lot better and if they are indeed your friends they hopefully they will agree so my last tip is leading on from that, that you know giving up alcohol isn't going to cure all the other things but now you've got all that extra time that your brain isn't thinking about booze that you can have a go at breaking the other bad habits uh, in my case weight has always been a problem so the most simple tip is to do what you try and do with alcohol before is keep all the temptation out of the house so like don't have chocolate biscuits and ice cream in the house make it hard to get them make it so that you you have to make a trip out in the rain to get them uh, and that is such a simple tip but it works for other things you're addicted to as well as alcohol and yeah that's that's all really really simple tips so thank you for having the patience to get to the end of this i'm just going to sum up quickly i have now been sober for three and a half years and i'm completely confident that i'll never drink again i've done it this way using the easy way method with the cbt and hypnosis it isn't like aa um, AA, they basically tie you to them for life uh, because of the fear of relapsing. But I completely understand that there are people who prefer that method and who, who, who want to go along to a regular community meeting and who like to have their buddy that they can ring up. I am not knocking that method. So I've broken my habit. Just like Alan Carr says, it takes about three weeks for your body to break a habit. And I don't have the fear of relapses because this method takes the pressure away from, from you. So I can go into a restaurant with somebody and I can have a dessert that contains rum. And I know that that isn't going to make me drink again. I can be in a pub with somebody and we've ordered non-alcohol beer. And the only one they have is the 0.5%, which also is called non-alcohol. And I know that that won't make me drink again. So... My mind is completely free of pressure of alcohol and I'm grateful for that every single day. My friendships are now normal. They are not based on alcohol transactions. My health is greatly improved. I've hit my healthy weight for the first time in 30 years. My diabetes is in, currently in remission. I've managed to reverse my diabetes too. And as for financially, well, I can't even estimate how much I spent on booze. It was at least a hundred pound a week. And that's not because I was earning huge amounts of money either. It was money I borrowed or begged or, you know, loaned from people as well as, you know, raiding my savings. Yeah, I, I was pretty much financially ruining myself. So all I can say is it's never too late if you're thinking about giving it up definitely have a have a go with this method i highly recommend using it i hope this has been helpful um i've designed this little um, video in sections so that you can use the slides separately by all means screenshot them send them to people you think this might be uh, useful for thanks for having the patience to get to the end of this and uh hope to see you in the next videos which are more going to be about art and not about not about me. <laughs>